Where's my cap? <laughs> ah, here it is. Take it easy, Dad. Now, where are you rushing off to? I'm going up the back hill. I'm checking to see that crowd don't start putting those pylons up. I saw that fella talk to that husband of yours there last week. Danny was discussing farm things, Dad, mm. and there's no pylons going up. Come here. Look out there. Hills as far as you can see, and there's not one pylon in sight. We went through all this before, remember? I remember all right, Annie. I remember you, your mother and me. We were a great team. <laughs> the three of us standing firm, so none of that crowd would get onto our land. Yeah, and we won that fight with Danny's help. They're going to be putting them all underground anyway. I don't know what you're fussing about. You can't trust nobody. We spent years standing up for ourselves when no one else did. Give someone an inch. Next thing, there's changes happening all over the place. I've let that fellow of yours turn this farm upside down. What's he at anyway? Look, I'm the farmer now, Dad. You know that. I make the decisions. It's me that wants to see this farm work so we can all have a good living. I am the one who has made all of the decisions. I changed the crop production and it's me that decided to reduce the herd. What would we have to change? Don't know what was wrong with the way I was doing things. Oh, Dad, Dad, you taught me everything. And I, I know that you farmed this land with love and care. You taught me everything about the land and nature. And you always said that we shouldn't cut down the old oaks in the back field or, or drain the ponds where they used to play among the hazels and watch the tadpoles. <laughs> And you, you would never tear down any of the hedges. You used to say that there was more life in there than there was in a pub on a Saturday night <laughs> in the town. <laughs> but all of those things, they're just as important to me as learning about the cattle or, or dealing at the mart or, or how to get better yields. But it's all so risky. Are you not afraid? Look, of course I am. But I have to, to take risks. Like, the world is changing, Dad. We can't go on polluting the rivers and lakes and using pesticides and increasing carbon. Look, I'm prepared to change because I know the end result will be better for us all. And for him, the next generation, go and start your home up there, Paddy. I'll, I'll have your tea ready for you in a few minutes. Well, how's Paddy? All right. I admit, I didn't think much about the future generations and Till young Paddy here started growing up. He knows more about climate change than I'll ever know. <laughs> He's like his mother. Yeah. He's strong-willed. Well, if he wants to farm, he will. He's still young, still learning, and sure that his whole life's ahead of him. What are they at out there? He's planning something, isn't he? Don't think I don't know what's going on around here. You're planning to knock down the slatted shed, aren't you? What are you at? Look, we're building a small wind generator there, Dad. Wait till you see how efficient it is. It's going to pay for itself in no time, trust me. Oh, I can't get used to all these changes. Everywhere I look. And what were they doing up the back hill, Annie? We're going to put a small wind farm up there. Now, don't look at me like that. Look, it's not the same. Look, I know what I'm doing. We've gone through the pros and the cons, Danny and me, and Danny knows all about the technology side of things. And look, it's a great project. It'll benefit all of us. And it's going to be a great asset for the area. We can't stand still anymore, Dad. Not anymore. Whenever I see all newfangled things, I just get afraid. Not like we used to be buying a new tractor or putting up another shed. Just don't understand all these modern way of things. Mm -hmm. But, but I trust you, Annie. I trust you'll do the best for all of us and for Pawdy. Hmm. I suppose I just have to start looking forward instead of back. Even if I can't see what's ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Paddy.
Bring me down and we'll have a last look at the owl shed before it's knocked down. Huh? Now, where's me cap, huh? It's on your head. <laughs> Come back here, you rascal, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They told us we were born into peace. But they proclaimed that they were the children. The violence bore them, raised them, and it was their might before us that forged the bridge over infernal persecution. Was it a lie? Was there ever armistice? Or just a momentary truce, laying dormant in darkness to detonate and cast its ruination upon us? You walk our streets now in the footsteps of shadows yet to live. And like Pompeii, you marvel at the exhibition laid out before you. A moment, a juncture, a point in time frozen from now till eternity so that generations can look on and speculate, suppose, theorize our forced inheritance. Yet it's not as docile as a painting, a, a dramatization or spectacle. No. no smoke and mirrors. Or maybe all smoke and mirrors too, reflecting the hardest truth, revealing the guiltiest flaws. These statues seem of stone, but within much more. For these sculptures once drew breath, once laughed, once cried, once loved, and once feared. And now they pose for you, captured in terror forever. So step inside, join the queue, and pay your admission, and walk among us through the pages and cobblestones of our story. And as you amble around our ashen streets, where humble homes crumble and blackened shells of shops now lie, remember us, the damned, crouching in fear and scrambling for life, clutching our faces in doomed hope. Nothing can be done. Like those condemned Romans, we have felt the ground shake and tasted the hot fumes that choke us casually as we sleep. And like them, we choose to stay, to ignore warning and seal our own fate. Behold, patron, our irreversible disaster, for we are the forgotten born in peace, but burdened still, struggling to lullaby a fast awakening conflict. We are the victims by descent, the inexperienced, drowned by circumstance and static, erected as our own headstones. We are the whispers. We are hell's fire. We are the new children. Fagin and the Virus is a, a little story of one man's uh, effort to understand and come to terms with this terrible pandemic and to get some idea of Fagan's understanding of the virus, you would really need to have some understanding of Fagan himself. But take it from me, understanding Fagan would require a lot of understanding. A sort of a rare breed, you know, bachelor farmer, living alone in a fairly rural area, wouldn't socialize a lot, keep himself to himself. Or as they'd put it in that part of the country, oh, he's not a man for going out much. The truth being told, Fagin had perfected the art of social distancing before ever it came into fashion. And if he's not a man for going out much, well, he's surely not a man for talking much. 
little or no conversation. Oh, and it's not that he can't talk. Oh, no, he just can't be bothered, I think. Owl jabbling, he calls it. Thinks it's a total waste of time. But let me tell you this. While other people are so-called owl jabbling, oh, he can be listening. Yeah. Keeps his ear to the ground, as they say. Knows damn well what's going on. Yeah. Probably knows a lot more than he'd let on. Now, as I say, he's not a man for going out or, or socialising or that. But he's not a total hermit either. Like, he'll, he'll go to the local shop for his bits and pieces. And he'll go to the chattel mart, but now only if he has chattel to sell. More damn good chattel he'd have. Oh, he's very fond of the chattel. They'd be well looked after. For the truth is, the chattel would have better living conditions and, and better medical care than he'd have himself. And he'll... He'll make the occasional trip to the bank, but now generally to lodge, seldom to a throw. And a fairly regular attender at the church fulfill his weekly obligation by attendance on the Mass. But now, apart from all that, his principal contact and communication with the outside world or the wider world, well, is his little transistor radio on the table, or as he calls it, the wireless. Now, the wireless suits Fagan. It does all the talk, and he has only to listen. And back at the latter end of 2019, it, it was bringing him news reports and, and stories from another part of the world, a place called China, where apparently a little virus had gone on the loose and was creating quite a story, uh, uh, making a name for itself now. But Fagin didn't get too concerned about it at that point because, well, having grown up in a farm and been close to animals all his life, he, he wasn't totally unfamiliar with a virus. But he knew little or nothing about China, well, other than when, when he was a wee fella. Now, this is way back in the 1960s. Like, back then, he, he'd have thought that, that China was obviously very convenient at the North Pole because Santa used to bring him toys that were made in China. And because he had very fond memories of those toys that were made in China and came from China, like he was somewhat thinking that, you know, this wee virus that's, that's made in China or coming from China, there mightn't be a damn thing wrong with it. And he was fine, hard to believe, you know, that the stories about it were, were bad and they kept getting worse. And he didn't know whether to believe them or not. But then one day, to confound the thing entirely, the report on the wireless was that in China, they had just completed the, the building of a hospital in a mere seven days. Now, that put his ability to believe any of the stories to the pin of his collar, because he knew. He knew well from, from listening to so-called intelligent people and experts jabbling on the wireless that we'd be doing well in this country to, to build a hospital in seven years. However, now back to the virus. And didn't the wee bugger decide to prick out his little horns and go travelling? Headed off on a world tour, creating havoc as it went. And all the reports of, of sickness and, and suffering and death had a, had a terrible effect on Fagin, because believe it or not, Fagin is not a hard man. Not the ma a man to show emotion, granted, but a gentle creature with feeling. And he could feel for all the people that were suffering and, and sick. And like everyone else, he feared the inevitable, that the virus was, was heading his way. But his greatest fear and concern was that the cattle would get it. Oh, he was very fond of the cattle. Should the cows were the only close contacts he had. He used to talk to the cows, yeah, yeah. In the byre, when he'd be milking, the cows would turn round to look at them. And he'd chat away to them good, and he'd talk to them. Now, he had a lot of cows, and he had names in them all, and he knew them all individually just by looking at their face, the way you would identify another human being. But of of course, things changed like that was when he was milking in the old buyer. Like, it changed somewhat when he upgraded the system uh, and put up the Heronbone milking parlour. 
And if I can explain this correctly now, in the Herringbone Milton Parlour, the cows are all standing tight against each other. And he's down in a little pit at the rear end of the cow. So the cow can't turn around to look at him. So what happened then, after a period of time, he began to recognise each cow from the rear end instead of the face. But that was fine, but well, he wouldn't have been talking to them as much after that during the milking because well, in all fairness, now you couldn't blame him. It wouldn't be easy, I suppose, holding a conversation with the cow's back end. However, enough about cows. Back to the virus. Leap Year Day 2020. V-Day in Ireland. The first sighting of the virus in this country. Well, only you couldn't see the wee bugger, but he was there. And then the politicians and the medical experts all came jabbling on the wireless. And poor Fagan got very confused. He wasn't sure what they were on about. But you really, I don't think they were that sure themselves. He got very confused when they began trying to flatten a curve. He couldn't understand what flattening a curve had to do with a virus or any disease of any sort. And then, of course, the professors came on board and they were telling them that this virus was not an ordinary virus, that this virus was primarily transmitted by droplets from the mouth and nose as we speak or cough. Now, droplets from the mouth and nose. Now, that was news to Fagan because, well, he had come to that stage of life himself, you know, where on occasion, like he would experience the odd droplet, you know, but never from the nostril or, or the lip. And then, of course, came the lockdown and all the restrictions. Well, the restrictions didn't really affect Fagin too bad because, well, apart from the regular hand washing, he ticked all the boxes anyway. And they began, then they began to talk about COVID-19. And Sir Fagan, not being aware that COVID-19 was actually a nickname for coronavirus, he got totally confused and concerned because was there two viruses now or was it the one virus that, that split up? He was, he was wondering maybe would it be like the time that Little and Aldi came to Ireland. You know, rumour had it that there were brothers that fell out. And he was wondering, was corona and COVID maybe like the one family, you know. Well, well, he didn't think to be brothers because Corona, he thought, would be a, a wee girl virus. And then with the, with the travel limit, the two kilometre travel limit, sure, people had nowhere to go. And they began walking the roads. And every time he looked out or went out, there was somebody walking up the road or down the road, including his widow, his, his neighbour, the widow Maguire, whom he thought to be a little bit nosy and liked a bit of a gawk. And because, well, he didn't have the luxury of a bathroom in his little house. His toilet facility was, you know, basically to the four winds. So he had to be forever vigilant not to be caught in a compromising position and, well, where possible, operate under cover of darkness. And then back then, at the beginning of the, at the pandemic too, there was, there was a lot of talk about face covering and mask wearing, and would they become mandatory? And his concern there was, well, you know, if people cover their faces, will they become like the cows in the milking parlour, that you'd be recognising people from the rear end instead of the face? Now, it was not that he'd have a lot of callers renting to the house, but if somebody did come in a message, sure, he wouldn't have a clue who it was until they turned round to go home. And he got very frustrated and confused by the whole thing. And he needed clarification. And when Fagan needed clarification on any issue, he depended very much on a local guy called Murphy, the lad Murphy. Well, he was known as the lad Murphy, but like Fagan himself, it had been long and many a day since Murphy was a lad. But he was called the lad because, well, the lad was a figure of speech that he used on a fairly regular basis. And depending on the context in which it was used and the way in which it was delivered, it, it, it could have a multitude of meanings. You know, for example, everyday comments were even the weather, like, oh, sure, it's a great day, oh, sure. The good weather's the lad. Whatever's a bad day, oh, sure. That's a dirty, wet, old, cold bitch of a day. 
Oh, no, the bad weather's the lad. But a smart fellow, Murphy. Oh, considered by many to be intelligent, but by others to be just a smart arse. Now, Fagan didn't approach people directly, didn't go to the houses. That had nothing to do with the pandemic. When Fagan needed clarification from Murphy, he went to Mass. Because in the porch at the back of the chapel, that's where Murphy would be perched, him and the queer fellas discussing all the topical issues at that time. But the problem was, with the lockdown, there was no religious services. So we had to wait for restrictions to be lifted in order to get clarification. But even then, there was a further problem. Because of the limitation on numbers, the obligation to attend Sunday Mass had been spread across the entire week. So we had to establish what day of the week it was that Murphy was attending Mass. So we carried out surveillance on the movements of Murphy, and that coupled with a process of elimination, well, he concluded that at that point, Murphy was attending Sunday Mass on a Friday evening. So on the Friday evening that followed, he got his milking and his job and rounded up early. And as he set off on the first leg of his journey to clarification, he encountered even further confusion. For when he entered the porch at the chapel, he discovered that, well, the holy water had been upgraded to a pump system. And as he performed his customary sprinkle, he could tell by the, the smell and the tack of it, well, it had some ulterior function other than the mere cleansing of the soul. He wasn't sure what. However, to further his own cause, he shuffled with an earshot of Murphy, who had already gained the full attention of his gossip greedy brethren as he related the parable of the unofficial she bean and the antics of his proprietoress, the one and only Widow Maguire. Now, the basis for that particular piece of gossip was that the widow, herself a lady to enjoy life in an effort to uplift the spirit of her community in such dismal times, set up a little she bean in her own backyard, which apparently was very well attended and served the purpose well. However, it came to the ears of the law. But on the particular day that the guardy arrived to investigate, the widow was unavailable for questioning. For earlier that morning, God love her, hadn't she just gone off to Tenerife with a toothache? However, the antics of the widow had been of little interest to Fagan. He decided, well, in order to uh, kickstart the, the discussion in his own favour. So clearing his throat, he momentarily broke a silence as he muttered, <coughs> a bloody virus. Oh, the virus, says Murphy. Oh, this virus is the lad. Now, Murphy's rendition of the lad on that particular occasion sent a shiver down Fagin's spine. Oh, he knew that this virus was bad news. And for the couple of minutes that followed, Murphy became a total expert on infectious diseases as good as any professor on the wireless. But unfortunately, only as good, leaving Fagin little the wiser. Dejected and disappointed, Fagin darted through the door, headed straight home, parked the Massey Ferguson, said good night to the cows, on entering his humble abode, bolted the door firmly behind him. Lowering the patching bottle from the mantel shelf, with a single puff of breath, blew the dust from it as he reclined into his favourite seat. Well, actually, the only chair in the house. As the magical powers of his medication began to take effect, who should come on the wireless but the man himself, Professor Luke O'Neill, gabbling profusely of the scientific advances towards a vaccine, the only escape route, in his opinion, from this terrible pandemic. Poor Fagan had had enough. Upstanding, he there and then single-handedly staged the first ever anti 
vaccine protest. Punching in one hand, with the other, raising the wireless tail level, he went head to head with the professor. Breaking his silence for the second time in a single day, he firmly proclaimed, Ah, cap yourself on, O'Neill. Why do we need a vaccine for a virus that is primarily transmitted, as he put it yourself, by droplets from the mouth and nose? Huh? Why the hell can people just keep their mouths shut and stop blowing their noses? Incidentally, that particular protest gained no media attention. Well, it was held behind closed doors. I have been requested here to give my view on <clears throat> certain points. Perhaps first I should state who I am. The Reverend Patrick Murray of Maynooth College. By accident, I happen to be born in Clonus, here in County Monaghan. I have been described as strong-willed, and perhaps some may even think of me as controversial <laughs> for the life of me, I, I don't know why. But I do have my principles and my beliefs and, of course, my vocation in the priesthood. Now, there are two points that I have been asked, well, more compelled to record from my experience to your good selves. Yes, it is true that I felt that my life came close to extinction one night in Glasslock by a band of intoxicated Protestant men whom, by their talk and boasts, were evidently members of the Orange Lodge. Were it not for the intervention of a man named Williamson, my bedroom door would have been smashed, all to see if I were a Catholic or a Protestant, which they can tell by sight. Indeed, I myself, when I was a lad, could pass through a crowd of thousands and with almost inuring accuracy knew who belonged to each of the two religions. However, on this particular night, these men boasted without shame of the spilling of papist blood in Cloish fights. One of their uh, party tunes went like this. <clears throat> Och, it's us that bait the papists at the Cloish fighting fair, for the boys of Lisbalaw had a noble body there. We chased them through the diamond and down Fermanagh Street till not a popish face in the town would you meet. And the loyal clowish yeomen, they did join the fun till like water in the gullions, the rebel blood did run. Yes, I, I do remember these bad times and even some of the decked out clerical orange men. Now, to the second point that I have been asked to mention. The ribbon men. Ribbon men, the bane of my life. Let it be known to you all here tonight that the Catholic clergy, unlike some other clergy around, throughout this land, have condemned and denounced in the most uncompromising language, these ribbon societies. I have had great experience to know a good deal about these societies, and I can testify that they are comprised of the most insignificant number and most contemptible section of the Catholic population. The very scum of the lowest order. The sweepings of back lanes and road vagrancy. No person of the least respectability belonged to them or associated with them. Now, I speak from a, a period and, and place known to me. If another picture can be drawn of other places and times, I know not. A score or two of this band would hold their clandestine orgies in a low house owned by a man named Jay... A man who some years later was transported for sheep stealing. I knew him well. 
and his son too, a noted pilferer, who not improbably has since joined his expatriated parent, I should not wonder. However, in my opinion, if the atrocities of Orangism were not there, perhaps it would not have acted as the recruiting sergeant. But it was. So subsequently contributed to, to swell the ranks of the ribbon societies. And as a result, the, the party fighting fairs became the order of the day. I, indeed, many, many, many people would, would take part in these. And, and whenever the, the, the cause of these savageries were examined, well, in truth, the, there didn't have to be a reason in many cases. Uh, for example, uh, just the, exa just the, the, the sport of bloodletting was enough. I mean, there could be a cause. Of, for example, the, the Battle of Kirkimmons Hill, where the body of a Catholic convert from Protestantism was fought over as to where he should be buried, in a Catholic or a Protestant graveyard. As a matter of information, the, the late Burke distinguished himself at this battle. And so the, the faction fighting fairs continued, albeit in different ways, until some sense and justice shall prevail, will prevail, someday, perhaps. <laughs>